Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. The Mandalorians are by far one of the coolest cultures in all of Star Wars lore, and it's pretty obvious why. I mean, they have a lot of things that we just simply don't have nowadays in our modern society. Things like their warrior heritage, independent spirit, and of course, awesome armor and arsenal of weapons. As a matter of fact, the entire Mandalorian race was spawned out of Boba Fett after his character was so well received by fans of the original trilogy. The bounty hunter hardly had any lines in Empire Strikes Back, but his armor and iconic helmet were so cool looking that everyone just wanted more. George Lucas, being the business guy he is, turns a few lines of background uh, description on what was a background character into an entire culture in his universe. You would think that a group of people whose sole purpose within Star Wars was to sell a few more action figures to kids would lack a complicated storyline. But if you guys know the Mandalorians, you'll know that their story is very complicated. It's also convoluted, controversial, full of twists and turns. And now that, you know, Disney canon is bringing in a lot of the old legendary expanded universe elements of the Mandalorians back into the canon lore, it's getting even more confusing to discern the difference between what was expanded universe and what now is Dave Filoni's Mandalorian. But what is clear is the way the Mandalorians have been living or surviving is probably a better term, is just not sustainable. Their population is in decline, their people are scattered, which is why everything in the third season of The Mandalorian points to the reunification of the Mandalorian people. If they don't hurry up, they're gonna run out of people to procreate with. Well, actually, that's not the real way the Mandalorians add new members to their society. They usually end up, you know, killing and pillaging villages and then picking up the orphans. It kind of sounds messed up. But now that I think about it, a lot of things about Mandalorian culture, you know, are kind of romanticized by the Star Wars lore, but if you take a closer look at it, none of this makes sense, and most of it is uh, kind of messed up. And it all starts deep beneath Sindari City, the formerly domed capital city of Mandalore. And I always thought it was a beautiful place. It's a shame that when we finally get to see it in live action, it's completely destroyed, but at least we're here. After Din Djarin becomes an apostate for removing his helmet in front of others, the Mandalorian returns to the broken world of Mandalore, seeking to submerge himself in the living waters beneath Sundari City. This cleansing or baptism should in theory allow Din Djarin to return back to his own people as a full-blown Mandalorian. And plus, because he has the Darksaber, he actually now has a legitimate claim on the throne. Speaking about legitimate claims, check this out, guys. Yes, this is what you think it is. Kenobi! You know, the first time I saw one of these things, these high-end looking like uh, premium lightsabers, much better than the ones you get like at the convenience stores, I've always been waiting for someone to design exactly this, the Darksaber. It's always really obvious to me why it was difficult to design one of these things, and that's because the blade shape is completely different from all the other lightsabers. But now, Onasaber.com has cracked it with the Darksaber. Well, it's actually called the Moon Saber, and I gotta say, everything from the heft of the hilt, I mean, I could really feel this lightsaber judging me for all the crap I've talked about, you know, Mandalorian culture, to how this one-off lightsaber tube is designed is all top-notch. But that's not all Onusaber.com has new in store. They also got this, which is really cool. It's a scabbard, and it's great for holstering your lightsaber. If you're like me, you can practice a little bit of it, Sui. Hey, Gongo, release that uh, little critter you found in the ventilation system yesterday, huh? <laughs> that is what you get, Sea Demon. We're trying to walk on land. Anyway, guys, if you want to check out the Black Moon Saber or the Scabbard, check out the description down below for more information. Also, the Scabbard is compatible with every Ona Saber blade except for the Black Moon, obviously. And right now, if you purchase a Padawan or Master Saber, you get 50% off your Scabbard. If you get a Replica Saber, you get the Scabbard for free. Just add all the items together in your cart at checkout. Also, guys, you can use the promo code MAN20. That's all cap for 20% off of your purchase. Thank you for your patience. On to the rest of the video. As Din Djarin enters the waters beneath the mines of Mandalore, something pulls him under, and Bo-Katan cries must dive in to save him. She actually needs to save him, like, several times in this episode. He's a little bit more useless than normal. And while Bo-Katan is swimming Din back to the surface, she actually sees a mythosaur. 
This is a huge deal for many reasons. The Mandalorians love fighting, killing, and eating large creatures. Whether it's the giant alligator snapping turtle thing they could have easily ran away from, or the crate dragon on Tatooine. Mythosaur is not only larger than these other beasts, but they also play a really special role in Mandalorian culture and tradition. Take a look at the most important Mandalorian sigil, and you'll notice that it's the skull of a Mythosaur. You see, long ago when Mandalore the Great arrived first, the Mandalore, he went to that same cave where Din Djarin does his dip, and this happened to be a lair for a mythosaur. Not only did Mandalore the Great not die from his encounter with this mythosaur, he managed to tame the beast and then ride it. And that basically is the biggest flex you can have as a Mandalorian. And as important as the Darksaber was to the Mandalorian clans, Defeating a Mythosaur probably will put you in the running for, uh, you know, the Mandalore position based on Cloud alone. And that was especially the case in Din Djarin's time. You see, the Mythosaur was thought to have been extinct for quite some time. So, Bo-Katan witnessing these Mythosaurs is like Daenerys Targaryen bringing those dragons back to life. It is a special moment. But a thought did pop up into my head while I was watching this scene. I thought to myself, what if this whole story of Mandalore the Great defeating and riding the Mythosaur was just another lie? Just like the lie that these beasts were extinct. I mean, if you really think about it and you look at the size of this creature, it's kind of ridiculous to claim that you can tame something like this. And perhaps this is just another tall tale to give the throne of Mandalore a little bit more prestige? Heck, maybe the mythosaur we see in The Mandalorian is actually that original mythosaur that Mandalore the Great saw many hundreds of years ago. We don't really know how long these things live, and maybe Mandalore the Great saw this monster and is like, hey, this will be a really cool story I could tell people to kind of legitimize my throne even more. Now, obviously, I know that most likely is not going to be the case. Most likely what's going to happen is Din Djarin is going to eventually tame the mythosaur, ride it, unite the Mandalorian people, it's a little boring, it's a little expected, but, uh, but you know, what if that weren't the case? You know, bear with me just for a moment, okay? In a lot of ways, I think Mandalore the Great's pursuit of the Mythosaur, or just any Mandalorian leader's pursuit of the Mythosaur, is kind of an allegory of just the sad state of Mandalorian politics. I mean, since the earliest days, the Mandalorians have not chosen their leaders based on who is the wisest, who is the kindest, who is the best at managing. It's always been about who's the strongest, who has the, you know, mystical sword, who has ridden the mythical creature. It all kind of sounds like a bunch of five-year-olds wrote these rules. It just doesn't make sense. And for that reason, Mandalorian society has been heading towards disaster after disaster, and in its latest incarnation, they're barely keeping it together. I mean, things are rough for the Mandalorians. You used to have Mandalore's mass uniting everyone, and as if things weren't clear enough, the Darksaber became that leadership symbol, and it would be fought over time and time again by various Mandalorian clans, leading to several civil wars, death, and destruction. I mean, seriously, ever since Tar Vizsla united everyone with that Darksaber, it's been going downhill. Pre Vizsla used it to summon a horde of criminals to take over Mandalore. Maul then abused the system to take the Mandalorian throne and Darksaber from Pre Vizsla. Bo Katan was gifted the Darksaber later on, then united all of the Mandalorian houses together, which leads to one of the most terrible moments in Mandalorian history the Great Purge, which more or less destroyed the Mandalorian people and planets. Now, the children of the Watch blame Bo Katan for losing the planet to the Empire. They believe that she was never the rightful owner of the Darksaber, which is why she failed. But let's be honest, guys, uh, that's a stupid excuse. The Mandalorians had no chance against the entire Imperial Navy. It just was a very lopsided affair to begin with. The real reason why Mandalore lost was because it was already decimated by the time Imperial ships arrived in the system. For hundreds of years, the Mandalorians had lower than average birth rates and probably a much lower life expectancy rate because they enjoyed fighting and killing so much. The cycle of stupidity and self-inflicted wounds is really stupid, and if the Mandalorians want to have a resurgence, uh, you know, within their culture, they need to really try to reform and change things. And what better pair to do that than Bo-Katan and Din Djarin? 
I mean, we did a video recently breaking down how Bogotan was and how she was a terrible person in her earlier days and then transformed into this like wiser but more, more jaded individual we see in the third season. I mean, here's a woman who rejected her birthright as Mandalorian royalty. She rejected her sister's political movement, joined a terrorist organization who was in pursuit of reestablishing a more traditional Mandalore. Bogotan then ends up joining the political coup that overthrows her sister and eventually gets her killed. Bogotan then must join with their former enemies, the Republic, to retake her own world from her former allies, but soon after the Republic turns against her and throws her out as the Empire, which then forces her to change sides once again to enlist the help of the rebels. And then the second time she takes over Mandalore, everything is destroyed soon after. Bo-Katan has probably changed sides more times than Din Djarin has changed the liner in that stanky helmet of his. And luckily, after so much flip-flopping, death, and disaster, bo finally learned a few things about how the world works, and what to avoid, and what to pursue. And bo has finally come to the realization that the Darksaber is not, not as important as everyone makes it out to be. Wave that thing around, and they'll do whatever you say. You could say that she's given up, but I think she's just being realistic at this point in time. She also kind of, you know, makes fun of Din Djarin for going to the mines of uh, Mandalore for that little dip and rejuvenation. You are a fool. There's nothing magic about the mines of Mandalore. A lot of people were annoyed by bo attitude. They see her as like this spoiled, you know, kind of royalty kind of figure, but I really don't think that's the case here. Again, the poor woman's been through a lot, okay? I mean, like most people, she's made a bunch of stupid mistakes. As a kid, we've all joined, you know, domestic terrorist organizations, probably. But at the end of the day, she does reform herself. I mean, post-Death Watch, she spends most of her career trying to fix all the terrible things she did. And so whatever terrible action she commits during this time, we're not driven by her ego, but by her desire to truly do right by her people. She's not perfect, but at least she's not running away from her past. She's confronting it like a man, a woe man. And now she has more experience and insight than most Mandalorians about what's right and wrong with their society. I would argue that she has a lot more input to give to Din Djarin than that crazy, you know, hammer wielding murderer. <laughs> And Din Djarin, well, he's almost the opposite of Bo-Katan. His strengths are her weaknesses, and her strengths are his weaknesses. And when he's unconscious, she's usually awake. I mean, for instance, Din Djarin knows basically nothing about his own people. The Children of the Watch filled his head with a lot of mumbo-jumbo. But despite the strict teachings of his organization, Din Djarin has always had a good head on his shoulders, and he's turned out relatively normal, despite all of the craziness. He's always done the right things when necessary, even if it means going against the Bounty Hunter Guild's code or even the way. He might belong to the Mandalorian equivalent of the Taliban, but you can't deny that he has like a very kingly vibe to him. This man is almost surrounded by providence, or is that just that suit of Mandalorian armor he wears in that magical baby? And what he doesn't know, well, Bo-Katan is there to teach him. I mean, she might be really jaded and no longer have any desire to rule you know, the Mandalorians, but that puts her in a perfect place to be an excellent advisor to Din. And while Din might not be that knowledgeable about the Mandalorians, he does have personality traits that cannot be learned or mimicked or faked. Now, the Mandalorian has a lot of great supporting characters. You know, Baby Yoda, Bo-Katan, Ahsoka Tano. I mean, there are so many awesome characters that we oftentimes forget that this TV show is about Din Djarin. And this armor-clad individual, well, he's on an Arthurian tale. There's even dragons and wizards along the way. His destiny is clearly to be king. And bo isn't just there to advise Din Djarin. She's also a terrific fighter, and her fighting style really complements the Mandalorians really well. They're both good at different things. The Mandalorian is great at taking damage, whereas bo is great at dishing out damage. I would say that these two make a perfect couple. Not a romantic couple, unless, you know, there's a little flap in the armor or something, but more like a political couple. Now, obviously, these two are going to go after the Mythosaur, despite my best wishes for these Mandalorians to abandon their stupid ways. I mean, sometimes tradition and political procedure are necessary to actually seize power so that you can carry out, you know, that reform you wanted to carry out. In the Mandalorian diaspora, well, they seem more scattered apart than usual. So having something like the Darksaber or, you know, claiming the Mythosaur for your mount seems like a good way to go. 
But my hope is that once Din Djarin and Bo-Katan secure everything they need to begin unifying their people, they become voices for reason, reform, and moderation. We've seen how full of hate and chaos the Death Watch were. We've seen how naive and arrogant the new Mandalorians were. Perhaps now it's time for the Mandalorians to find a new way. Maybe they can bring back even the true Mandalorian way, which was a bit more moderate. I mean, they still believed in all of the old traditions and tales, but they approached it with a more logical and pragmatic view of what they know about the world. Now, maybe Din Djarin could, you know, replace the duels to the death of the Darksaber with, I don't know, elections? And maybe it'd be nice if Din Djarin didn't jump into the, you know, pool of water and wake up that Mythosaur by trying to ride it. It looked like it was sleeping. But one can only hope for so much. Anyway, guys, that's why I believe a lot of this stuff, maybe there is gonna be a twist at the end, you know, that all of this, all of the tales about Mandalore the Great are basically a lie. Or if they're not a lie, they're just not really good lessons to build a society on. The way I see things going, the way that Bo-Katan has kind of rejected, uh, you know, her own path and how Din Djarin has kind of also veered away from his own path, that the only thing that can happen right now is a rejection of past Mandalorian culture and the creation of something completely new. Let me know in the comment section below what you guys think. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.